Can the resistor and the cable really wreck your distortion? After 30 years of designing low distortion audio equipment, I found this hidden pitfall and fixing it improved my distortion more than 20 fold. So in this video, I'm going to show you the critical mistakes that almost everyone misses. The simple fixes and the unexpected lesson that changed everything for me so you can avoid this landmine blowing up on you. So in order to understand what's going on, you first need to understand exactly what distortion is. Here you see a 2 volt distortion free sine wave generator and a circuit block. The circuit block has a gain of 1 if the absolute value of the signal is smaller than 1 volt and a gain of 0.5 when the absolute value is larger than 1 volt. You can imagine what happens. The peaks and valleys of the sine wave are compressed, the red line in the plot. If the gain would remain at a constant value all the time, the signal would not be distorted. So distortion is created when gain changes with signal level. Now that you understand this, you can investigate how a wire and a resistor can cause distortion and four ways to solve it. I've run into dozens of traps like this over the past 30 years. I even teach a whole course on them. I also have a free checklist and one hour module. Links are in the description. But for now, let's get back to the real problem here. This is the setup. A very low distortion source, my high end duck in test mode, generating a one kilohertz sine wave, a power amplifier with extremely low distortion, a loudspeaker wire and a load resistor. I was measuring distortion with a QA401 analyzer connected to a laptop. I expected to see around minus 105 decibels at the load resistor, but I only got 80. That really worried me. I started thinking there might be something seriously wrong with my new amplifier design that I was testing. Strangely enough, when I checked the distortion at the amplifier's output terminals, it was better than at the load resistor. It seemed like the loudspeaker wire was causing the distortion. This didn't make any sense at all and it took me a while to figure out what was actually going on. So what is going on? The cable has a resistance of 15 milliohms. The load resistor has a value of 3.9 ohms. You can see the resistor in a circle here. The other ones on the image are not used for this measurement. They're shorted out with this black cable. This 3.9 ohm is not constant, however, because it has a temperature coefficient, which is larger than zero. This means that the value of the resistor changes slightly when the temperature changes. Almost all resistors have this. I'm using a wire wound resistor which means it's made by wrapping resistance wire into a tight coil. At the peaks and valleys of the sine wave, this wire dissipates a lot of heat compared to at the zero crossings where no heat is generated. This means the resistor value at the peaks and valleys is different than during the zero crossings. It's like the wire shrinks and stretches with heat and the signal gets wobbly as a result. If the value of the power resistor changes and the resistance of the cable remains constant, you'll see a small change in the division ratio of this resistor network. This means the loss of this network is changing with signal level and you've just seen that this causes distortion. Now a small change is all that it takes. Minus 105 decibel means that the distortion is 178,000 times smaller than the signal. So the slightest error will make that number worse. So now that you understand what's going on, Let's look at four possible ways to solve this. First, we can use a cable with less resistance, but you need really, really thick cables all the time, which is a little bit impractical. The second thing you can do is to use an insanely big power resistor. The idea here is that the heat spreads out so much that the resistor wire inside the resistors hardly heats up. This is an 800 watt power resistor compared to the 50 watts we had before and I made it especially for this video. I tried this and unfortunately that did not improve things as you can see. Still minus 78 decibels. This resistor must heat up far less but apparently has a much worse temperature coefficient which counters the improvement we were expecting. You may have guessed the third solution already. It's a smart one. Just measure directly at the output of the amplifier. This means the cable and power resistor can't have any effect on the distortion. It does require you to make a dedicated measurement point on your amplifier PCB, which I did. This design was made after I discovered this problem, so I adapted my design to it. This also proved extremely handy during other amplifier tests. Now for a fourth solution, you could also break into CERN and steal some superconductive wire. While you're there, also bring some liquid nitrogen so you can keep it cool so it stays superconductive. In this way, your cable has zero ohm resistance and that also solves the problem. However, I don't recommend this solution. Now at this point, I was ready to move on to the next distortion effect in resistors, but something just didn't feel right. It was around six years ago when I got my QA401 audio analyzer when I first saw this effect because this analyzer was the first one I owned that could actually measure this deep. Since I was suspicious about the distortion theory I just presented, I did a calculation to check it. As an engineer, whenever something doesn't quite add up, you should always try to verify it using a second method. That's exactly what I did here. I assumed a 10 degree temperature rise in the load resistor at the peaks and valleys of the sine wave compared to the zero crossing 
and calculated the resistance change it would cause with a 50 ppm per degree Celsius temperature coefficient of the load resistor. Then I calculated the change in voltage due to that and got a to a value that seemed very logical for the distortion that I was seeing, around minus 80 decibels. However, the test that I just showed you with a very high power 800 watt resistor is basically a second way to prove my theory and that seems to have failed completely. If my theory would have been right, distortion should have been much lower at the load resistor using this large 800 watt power resistor as a load. So I turned my setup back on and started investigating further. What is important to know is that the cable I used is the same one I used six years ago. I kept it together with the load resistor. The first thing I was suspicious about were the 4mm connectors. They were not soldered, but screw clamped. So I tried to tighten them down further. This was not easy as they were already very, very tight. However, after doing that, the distortion at the end of the cable was the same as at the beginning. At this point, my heart sank. I really thought this whole video was pointless now. Then I realized it actually makes this video even more important. It shows you a few things. First, you have to be very careful drawing conclusions. Even though I did some first order calculations to calculate the effects of the temperature coefficient in combination with the cable resistance, my conclusions still turned out to be wrong. Even though the outcome of those calculations was very close to what I observed. It shows you how easy it is to be fooled by results if they turn out to be close to what you expect. Second, if you want to guarantee low distortion in high power situations, you really have to tighten down all the screws or even better, solder the connectors. Now about what caused the distortion fundamentally. It could just be the contact resistance in combination with the temperature coefficient of the load resistor, the initial theory. I also understand that oxidized copper can cause this. Copper oxide apparently has a nonlinear behavior and this cable was quite old and oxidized. Maybe by tightening the screws, I broke the oxide layer and restored a distortion-free contact surface again. Also, I did the original calculations of six years ago and got to minus 114 decibels. So yeah, I'd love to blame someone else, but that was just me messing up the math. So what do we take away from this? First, never blindly trust your calculations. Second, always double check your setup, even the connectors. And third, this is the sneaky one. When your data or math perfectly confirms your theory, it's natural to become less skeptical and think you've solved it. But this is exactly when you should be the most skeptical, because that's when you're most likely to miss the real bug. I've encountered this many times over the last 30 years. So is this the end of the story? Not even close. There's another resistor distortion effect that can silently ruin your circuit. You could be using the best amplifier on the planet and still be stuck at minus 70 decibels. Luckily, the fix is simple once you know it. Let me show you. Here you see three identical resistive divider networks with 4.7 kilo ohms and 680 ohms. The measurement setup is the same as before. The amplifier is connected to the input of the network and the audio analyzer is connected to the output. The only difference between these three networks is the type of resistors that is being used. As you can see, there's a big difference in distortion. You also see a lot more peaks on these plots. That's because the impedance is much higher with these networks, which makes it much more sensitive to interference, in this case from the power grid. However, these peaks are all filtered out when determining the distortion. So why would you care that the resistor has low distortion? Because almost every amplifier circuit uses resistors to set the gain of the amplifier and thereby the distortion. Look at all these standard amplifier configurations. It's either a single or two resistors setting the gain. If the value of these resistors is signal level dependent in any kind of way, you'll get distortion. So what is the difference between the dividers I just showed you? The second and third network use thick film SMD resistors. These are the cheapest resistors you can get. However, they're also the worst. Next to having a temperature coefficient, just like the power resistors, thick film resistors also have an other signal dependent resistance due to their construction. You don't need any dissipation for this effect to occur, which makes it an even bigger problem. Depending on a thick film resistor series, this limits your distortion anywhere from minus 70 to minus 100 decibels. So you can never achieve better distortion than minus 100 decibels with these. There are a lot of op amps which perform much, much better, like the OPA1655, not sponsored here, which achieves minus 131 decibels. That's completely insane. I don't even know how I would start trying to measure that. Surprisingly, the datasheet mentions nothing about this resistor problem, while it is critical to get this thing to perform. So what is the magic solution here? Use metal film, thin film, or wire wound resistors. These don't suffer from the nasty effect in thick film resistors. You can see a full list of the most common resistor types and their distortion performance. Price can also be an issue. Bulk metal foil is fantastic and very affordable if you have a number of Ferraris in your garage. However, 
Just using a good resistor does not mean you're out of the woods yet. All resistors have a temperature coefficient. So if you dissipate a lot of power, like the power resistor example I showed you in this video, you may still have a problem. The solution here is to make sure you dissipate less than 10% of the rated power by selecting bigger resistors, like 1206 instead of 0402, and use a lower temperature coefficient. Now 25 ppm per degree is quite affordable at around 8 cents. 10 ppm per degree is 5 times more expensive at 40 cents. What I did in my power amplifier is using multiple 25 ppm resistors in parallel to artificially increase the power rating and thereby reducing the heating per resistor, limiting the problem. This also proved to be a little bit cheaper. So you've just seen how the wrong resistor can pretty much ruin your circuit's performance. If you're not aware of this, you could spend days or even weeks chasing ghosts. Imagine the cost of that. Electronics has dozens and dozens of these nasty surprises they don't teach you at school or university. And I have a whole course which contains 30 years worth of these surprises I ran into. And the list is still growing, even after 30 years. In the next video, I'll reveal how small mistakes in grounding can completely ruin your product and three very simple rules to prevent that. You can see that video right here. See you next time.